Here's an interesting challenge. Imagine you're talking to a fresh high school graduate from the United States of America, and your challenge is to name one mathematician that you're confident this high school graduate will know. And let's just suppose it's the life of your mother which is on the line. What mathematician are you going to name? Perhaps David Cox and Stephen Zucker. Or perhaps not. No, of course, with such high stakes, you're going to name Pythagoras. Not because he's the greatest or most accomplished mathematician, but because there is no other name that is so firmly attached to a single theorem that is drilled into the heads of every high school student. But things get interesting if the challenge was excluding Pythagoras, or let's just suppose you had to name one more. Pythagoras is a surefire hit, but what if you had to name one more mathematician that this fresh high school graduate knows? You might want to try your luck with Isaac Newton or perhaps Leonard Euler. Archimedes might even be a safer bet but particularly if the student has to be familiar with some of the actual mathematics from the named mathematician, I think your best bet might be Heron of Alexandria. Heron of Alexandria was a Greek mathematician and a brilliant mind, renowned both for mathematics and his inventions. He truly was a man who looked for horses, not zebra, and almost everybody will have a passing familiar familiarity with him thanks to Heron's formula. His famous formula is used by students all over the world to calculate the area of a triangle from its side lengths. Let's say this triangle has side lengths 3, 4, and 5. You may recall that Heron's formula requires we calculate the semi-perimeter. That means add the lengths of the sides and divide by 2, half of the perimeter. If we add the lengths of these sides, we get 12, and if we cut that in half, we get 6. The semi-perimeter is 6, and from here, it's straightforward to calculate the area. If we go ahead and call that area A, busting out Heron's classic formula, the area is the square root of the semi-perimeter multiplied by the semi-perimeter minus the first side, multiplied by the semi-perimeter minus the second side, multiplied by the semi-perimeter minus the third side. This, of course, turns out to be a nice and easy, friendly example. This is the square root of 6 times 3 times 2 times 1. That's the square root of 36, so in fact, the area of the triangle is 6. This formula was known before Heron's time, but he proved it in his work called Metrica, which is dated to around 60 AD. Although this is the greatest hit that everybody knows, in Metrica, Heron also introduced something else that I think is way more interesting and computers still use today. It's something called Heron's method, a shockingly good way to compute square roots. Let me show you how it works. If we actually need to use a number, like the square root of 2, in real life, we're going to need some decimal approximation. Thus, we need a method to get an approximation. Of course, these days you can just bust out a calculator, press 2, and then the square root button, and get a great approximation. But with Heron's method, we can figure this out ourselves. We don't need to appeal to Mary Kay to approximate the square root of 2. The idea of Heron's method is to construct a sequence of approximations for the square root that get better and better. We need to begin with some guess. Let's just guess the square root of 2 is somewhere close to 1. It doesn't matter if our guess is far off, as long as it's positive, the method will work out. Then, Heron's method tells us how to get a better approximation to the square root of 2 using our first guess. We have to calculate 1 half multiplied by the previous guess, which was 1, plus the number whose square root we are trying to approximate, which is 2, divided by the previous guess, which is 1. This is 1 plus 2 multiplied by a half, that's 1 half of 3, which is 1.5. This is indeed closer to the square root of 2 than this is, but we can continue this process using Heron's method to get better and better approximations. If we want a better approximation, let's just do the same thing. Take 1 half multiplied by the previous guess, which is 1.5, plus 
2 divided by the previous guess of 1.5. This turns out to be 1.416 repeating. So our approximation after only two calculations already has the first three digits correct. You can look back at our calculator to verify. If we go one step further in this sequence, we get a really, really good approximation for the square root of two. We get about 1.414215686227, which is in fact accurate to one, two, three, four, five, six digits now, after going only four terms in to this sequence. And of course, for whatever accuracy we desire, we could continue this process. It almost seems like sorcery, how good this method works, but why does it work? It's actually really simple. Remember, our first guess is one, and what Heron's method tells us to do to get the next term is to take that guess and then add the number whose square root we're trying to approximate divided by that previous guess and cut that in half. Now our first guess, one, is an underestimate of the true value of the square root of two. Whenever this is the case, two divided by that underestimate is going to be an overestimate. So we take an underestimate for root two, an overestimate, and then we find their average, add them together, divide by two. Naturally, that gets us a better approximation. This one, it turns out, is an overestimate, but then two over 1.5 is an underestimate. So you've got an overestimate, an underestimate, find their average, you get a better approximation. That's just an intuitive justification for why this works. Hold on a minute and we will actually prove it. Indeed, the principle I just described is very straightforward, so it should be no surprise that Heron's method isn't just for the square root of two, it works for any positive number. Of course, negative numbers don't have square roots, although if your initial guess is a negative, the sequence will converge towards the negative root. So in the case of four, for example, the negative root would be negative two. When considering a process like this that can be used for approximating something so important as square roots, it's important to consider how fast it it works. In this case, it gave us a great approximation very quickly, but in general, if this method is really, really slow, then it wouldn't be very practical. But like I said earlier, computers today still use this method. Heron's method is what we call quadratically convergent. This means it's a very good method, and with each iteration, the number of accurate digits will roughly Double. Going back to our terms, if we just look after the decimal point, this number had two accurate digits, and our next approximation actually had five accurate digits after the decimal point. So not only can the method be used to approximate square roots, but it doesn't take long to give you a phenomenal approximation. That means it's actually practical. It has more than just historical interest. All right, so I'm telling you it works. I'm telling you it works well, and intuitively it makes sense. But how how can we be sure that applying Heron's method can get us arbitrarily close to the square root that we desire? Well, I suppose we should prove it. So here's the validity of Heron's method that we're going to prove. Let t and a1 be positive real numbers. t is the number whose square root we're trying to approximate, and a1 would be our initial guess. If a n plus 1 is equal to this, so we're using Heron's method to construct this sequence, then the sequence is going to converge to the square root of t. To prove this though, we're going to have to do three things. First, we're going to prove that our sequence is bounded below. When we use Heron's method, we actually get overestimates, and we're going to prove that. Then, we will have to prove that our sequence is decreasing. So we get overestimates, but these over estimates are getting smaller and smaller. And then we'll be able to use what's called the monotone convergence theorem and the recursion that defines the sequence to finally establish our claim. The monotone convergence theorem tells us that if a sequence is bounded below and decreasing, then it must have a limit. It must converge to something. And hopefully that's not too hard to believe. Indeed, if the terms of a sequence are decreasing, one possibility is that they decrease 
space without bound, they just go towards negative infinity. But the other possibility is that the decreasing sequence is bounded. That means it can't decrease towards negative infinity, it must in fact decrease towards some limiting value. So once we know our sequence has a limit, we'll be able to use the recursion that defines it to establish exactly what that limit is. This might seem like a lot, especially if you haven't done proofs like this before, but I think you'll be surprised at how easy all the steps turn out being. All right, for starters, to prove that our sequence is bounded below, we need to prove that a n plus one is greater than or equal to something. And as I said before, the sequence actually gives us overestimates for the square root. So we can prove that it's greater than or equal to the square root of t. Now notice by writing a n plus one, we are skipping over the first term. The first term, since it's just an initial guess, might be less than the square root of t. But after that, the terms of the sequence will be bounded below by this number. And for sequence limits, it's that long-term behavior that matters. It's not a big deal that the first term might not behave that way, as long as all the terms after a certain point do. This is the inequality we want to prove, but it will be useful to play with it a little bit. We're going to square both sides. So we have that a n plus one squared is greater than or equal to T. And remember throughout this proof that all of these named numbers like T and AN, AN plus one, all of those numbers are positive. Now, subtracting both sides from this inequality, we get that AN plus one squared minus T is greater than or equal to zero. And this is what we're going to prove, which is equivalent to this original inequality. So we'll work with this difference. First things first, we can rewrite AN plus one like this by our recursion. Remember, a n plus one is equal to one half times this, so just distribute that one half, that's how we get this. Actually squaring this binomial gives us this, and now we can subtract t from t over two to get negative t over two. Now from this expression, we'll factor out one fourth. And then we must recognize that this is a perfect square so that we can factor it into a binomial squared. Indeed, you can verify yourself that if we square a n minus t over a n, we would get this expression back. So we end up here and this for sure is at least zero. We know that because this is squared. And of course, any square is non-negative multiply it by a fourth, it's still non-negative. Hence, we've shown that this difference is greater than or equal to zero. And so we have proven this inequality, which is equivalent to this one, which is equivalent to this original one we wanted to prove. Indeed, our sequence is bounded below by the square root of t. Remember, the next step is to show that our sequence is decreasing, and this is a little bit less messy. So we're going to look at a n plus one minus a n. Since our sequence is decreasing, this difference should be non-positive because from a n to a n plus one, the terms of the sequence should just be getting smaller. So if we subtract the previous one, we should have something that's non-positive. That of course means it's less than or equal to zero. To prove it, of course, we'll begin by replacing a n plus one with what it's equal to by that recursive formula. It's equal to half of a n plus half of t over a n. So that's a n plus one. And then of course there's our minus a n. Now to combine all of these terms, we're going to get common denominators. So multiply this by a n over a n and multiply this by 2an over 2an. That gives us this, and then of course, an squared minus 2an squared is negative an squared. Thus, we can rewrite as t minus an squared all over 2an. Now, 2an is positive because the terms of our sequence are positive. And remember, back in the previous step, we showed that an plus one squared minus t is greater than or equal to zero. That means if we flip this t minus a n plus one squared, like we essentially have here, this must be less than or equal to zero, which means this fraction is less than or equal to zero. 
as desired. So again, in the previous step, we showed that a n plus one squared minus t is non-negative. So if we negate it and then look at t minus a n squared, this has to be non-positive. Because this earlier inequality has a n plus one squared as opposed to a n squared, this skips over a one. So we may want to specify here that n needs to be greater than one. But again, small detail like that doesn't really matter because when we're arguing for the limit of a sequence, it's the long-term behavior that matters, not little exceptions at the start of the sequence. All right, first two steps of our argument are done. Now we can use the monotone convergence theorem. We know that our sequence has a limit. It has to because it's bounded below and it's monotone. It is decreasing. It doesn't go up and down and all around, it just goes down. So with the monotone convergence theorem, we now know that the sequence of terms created by applying Heron's method does have a limit. We're going to call that limit A. Of course, it's our objective to show that this limit A is in fact the square root of T. For now, we just know that it's the limit of our sequence, which is written like this. It is the limit of A n as n goes to infinity. But remember what I said about long-term behavior. We could skip over the first term, and that of course isn't going to change the limit. So this is the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of A n plus one. What's the point of writing that? Well, we can replace A n plus one with all of this stuff by that recursion. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of a n over 2 plus t over 2 a n. Again, remember, we're just distributing that one half through the parentheses. But then by limit laws that you may or may not be familiar with, we can apply the limit to these terms individually because they both exist. The limit of a n over 2 as n goes to infinity is a over 2. And the limit of t over 2a n as n goes to infinity is t over 2a because we know that a n goes to a as n goes to infinity. Thus, this limit is equal to a over 2 plus t over 2a. So now we have that a is equal to this and we just have to solve for a. Since a is equal to this, let's go ahead and multiply everything by 2a to get rid of the fractions. Thus, on the left, we have 2a squared and this is equal to a squared plus t. Then just subtract a squared from both sides. So a squared is equal to t. And then taking the square root of both sides, we have as desired that a, the limit of our sequence, is the square root of t. Remember that it's not possible a is negative because our initial guess was taken to be positive. So all the terms of the sequence are positive, so the limit is as well. And that's the proof of the more interesting Heron's formula that they don't really teach you in high school. By making an initial guess at a square root and then just taking averages over and over again, you can get as good of an approximation of a square root as you want. I've known about this method for a while, but it was reading about it again in Jay Cummings' new book, Math History, that really made me want to talk about it. So I'll leave a link in the description if you want to pick up this incredible new book by Jay Cummings. Check it out on Amazon. It's really awesome. It's only like 30 bucks. Must buy, must read, in my opinion. Let me know in the comments if you had any questions, and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm unstable, I'm feeling hard to keep a cable cut and unsort the table If Texas instruments don't reply, well, I think this time it might be fatal I Wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm jaded Hate the odds that I calculated Press and pull and pray and push it all the way through the whole blue planet Faded,